chased by a tornado. She says, Dad, we're going to die. We're going to die, Dad. A wildfire out of control. Dude, your, your life ain't worth it, man. And an unexpected guest at a wedding. I was like, that's not true. There's not a tornado. Plus, the dust storm of a lifetime. Credit for his life. And... Surviving a 9.0 earthquake on top of the highest tower in Tokyo. I was a little bit worried that the, the tower was actually going to collapse. Avalanches. It completely engulfed it. And floods and hail of epic proportions. Uh-oh. It's all up next on this edition of Weather Caught on Camera. Family being chased by a tornado with few options seeks shelter in a highway overpass under here, under here, under here. and holds on for the ride of their lives. April 26, 1991, Kansas. Butch Gilbert and his daughters are driving south on the Kansas Turnpike. No stranger to tornadoes, Butch is not concerned about the weather. April's early for the tornado season in Kansas. I figured we were we would be okay, hadn't heard anything. Suddenly, Butch sees something in the distance. Maybe a mile away, there was a tornado, and we could tell that that tornado was coming directly toward us. Carrie, who's the younger, was in the back seat, and she says, Dad, we're going to die. We're going to die, Dad. At the time, Corey Gilbert Wallace is 14 years old. If you're in Kansas, you've seen The Wizard of Oz, you know, a million times. But I don't know that I knew what a funnel cloud was going to look like. I certainly didn't know how big it was going to be, and I didn't know how fast it could move. The tornado is one of 54 developing that day. A series of twisters that ultimately kills 24 people. In his car, with the twister approaching, Butch knows he needs to locate a ditch to protect his family, but he can't find one. Typically, you want to be down low in a ditch or underground below the fast winds. At the same time, a news crew capturing the tornado on camera is also looking to save their own lives. Watch back to Greg's catching us. You got to go, buddy. Both have the same idea. Seek shelter under this overpass. Let's go. Get up under here, under here, under here. The twister is barreling towards them, and tornadoes can move at speeds approaching 70 miles per hour. There was no other option for us, and there was no way that we could have kept on driving. I think if we would have kept on going, we would have been trapped in the car in the tornado, and that we would not have survived that, I think. Get up under the girders. Is that where we want to go? Yes. And when people see us running up underneath the overpass, they're really seeing people who are out there. They don't have any other options. There's nowhere to run. There's no way to escape this. We just gotta survive this. Many people see overpasses as a place of shelter, but in fact, experts say that it can actually be the worst place to go. Going upward is a bad idea. And then in the case of an overpass, there's embankments with an opening there that you're going up under, that will let the wind squeeze through there. So it's like squeezing a tube of toothpaste that really squirts through there faster than the prevailing winds. The tornado makes a beeline towards the overpass, as if it's seeking out the people hiding underneath. I don't know that we're gonna survive this. Am I gonna be ripped limb from limb? You know, are my guts gonna be ripped out of my body? Like, when you're a child, you don't know what's possible. Finally, the moment they are dreading arrives, and the frightened group holds on to the overpass girders and each other. I will never forget that sound. That was, that was so loud, and at the same time as the, the temperature dropped, and you could feel the pressure, and the sound was so loud, you could feel the sound. I could feel the sound. I 
think there there really is a sense of gravity. You can feel the gravity of of the tornado. Like there's a weight to it because there's so much velocity. I would say without a doubt that was the most intense 20 or 30 seconds of my life. I got you. Hang on. They take the brunt of it without a scratch, and the tornado keeps moving along the Kansas Turnpike. It's okay. It's over. It's over. Experts advise strongly against seeking shelter under a bridge or overpass. Most don't have the shelf this one does, so experts say they should be avoided. People should never seek shelter under an overpass. It does give the wrong impression that you can survive. It's terrible. It's a terrible thing to do. Butch and Corey reminisce from time to time about their brush with death. But younger sister Carrie doesn't join in. She didn't want to think about it. She had several times where she would wake up in the middle of the night and she would be dreaming about it. And it's, I think it stayed with her. Though experts say you should not ride out a storm beneath an overpass, the Gilberts are grateful for the one they found along Route 35. We were very, very lucky. We were very lucky. But not every driver is so lucky. The ones in this ice storm barely stand a chance. <laughs> January 16th, 2007. A teacher enjoying a rare snow day in Portland, Oregon, hopes for some quiet time off. Instead, he gets a front row seat to an unbelievable round of bumper cars. The situation gets so bad that when the fire department arrives to block off traffic, vehicles keep coming. And the truck meant to save the day ends up being smashed by two cars itself. First responders can be really in dangerous situations because they're prone to the same loss of control of the vehicle. And unfortunately, first responders could be right in the line of that uncontrollable vehicle. This Volvo is in accidents with seven vehicles, but in all those collisions, the driver only gets a gash in the head. The conditions are no better in Seattle a few years later. A resident takes this amazing footage as the Capitol Hill District turns into an ice skating rink just days before Thanksgiving. It just takes a very thin glaze of ice to cause extremely dangerous driving conditions. It's like putting a vehicle right out onto an ice rink. Even trained drivers, like the operator of Bus 43, are helpless in the face of all that ice. Ice is also a common culprit in the wet climate of southwest Britain. December 2009, two days before Christmas, a freak ice storm hits the southern coast of the United Kingdom. Craig Wynn decides to stay indoors and starts shooting the slippery scene. But he never expected to see this. He's on the car. He's on the car. Okay. Things are dangerous enough, but a thin layer of rain coats the ice. His neighbors are determined to get to work. But when they lose control, a bit of panic sets in. He's on the car. He's on the car. I just left the car. When we return, a day of touring in Tokyo nearly turns deadly. At some point, I, I was sitting down and I was praying. And a deluge causes mayhem in the island country of Mauritius. And later, a cameraman in a wildfire. The Williams fire is like a war zone. Dude, your, your life ain't worth it, man. When weather caught on camera continues. Forrest finds himself in the center of an historic moment. At the top of Tokyo's highest tower during the most powerful earthquake in Japan's recorded history. Oh my God. Carlos Asarta, an economics professor now at the University of Delaware, is invited to speak at the prestigious Waseda University. He lands on March 10th, 2011, all set for a day of sightseeing the following day. One of the professors that invited me uh, came to pick me up and we were gonna do a tour of Tokyo. And uh, Tokyo Tower was the first thing that we, uh, that we went to see. At the time, the 1,092 foot Tokyo Tower is the tallest structure in the entire country. 
and a favorite tourist spot where the map of the city really comes alive. It was the first thing I visited and the last thing I visited uh, in Tokyo. Not long after he gets to the top, Carlos starts to feel vibrations. But these vibrations are far from normal. And so I actually took my camera out. I started recording, not knowing that it was an earthquake. I just thought, this is cool. I'm going to show my wife when I get back how it kind of moves a little bit on the top. At first, I thought it was simply the wind just moving the tower. And the other professor that was with me said, oh, don't worry. This is, we're safe. And so I thought, well, this is an earthquake. Everybody's used to it. They're not going to do anything about it. It's no good. It's been a, but it's safe. And then all of a sudden, he started getting worried, and I could hear it. He was making noises. He was really worried, and then people started yelling and, and crying, and so I figured we were, we were in trouble. <laughs> we were in a little bit of trouble. Well, it was one of the larger earthquakes in recorded history, meaning since seismographs were developed and we can measure these things quantitatively. I had never experienced an earthquake, so I didn't know uh, what it felt like, but seeing the locals being so scared, I figured that it was, it was a, serious, a serious event. Carlos Asarta has found himself on top of the tallest structure in the country during a 9.0 magnitude earthquake. Magnitude 9 is about the largest we normally get on the, uh, on the Earth here. There must have been somebody that was extremely afraid, and you can hear it throughout the whole recording just screaming. Or maybe a couple of people just screaming. Tokyo is as prepared for an earthquake as any city in the world. But to Asarta, it seems like this tower may not be able to handle an earthquake of this magnitude. Oh my God. Carlos is far from home and far from solid ground. I knew I was in, in, a, in a deck and I knew there was absolutely nothing underneath me. And so uh, I was a little bit worried that the, the tower was actually going to collapse. And in fact, at some point, I, I was sitting down and I was praying. And, and thoughts of family and, and friends actually came through, but especially my children. Finally, the violent shaking stops. I think being behind the camera uh, helped, me get, helped me get through it, helped me uh, somewhat put some distance between the actual event and, and, my, and myself. What do you think, Atana-san? <laughs> oh, scary. <laughs> Very scary. Maybe we go down, huh? <laughs> Maybe we don't stay here, Atana-san. <laughs> and the elevators were not working, so we had to go down the stairs. Then when, once we got to the bottom, there was another earthquake. And apparently it was a seven-point-some earthquake. And I remember people, again, screaming. You cannot know whether that's a pre-shock or whether it's the main shock. You just have no, no idea whether there's going to be another one following it. Today, he may be far from earthquake country, but it doesn't take much to bring him back to that frightening time and place. So I'm still a little bit shaken by it, but uh, I think with time, it will just get a lot better. A world away on a tiny island in the Indian Ocean off the coast of Africa, these residents are subjected to historic floods. In Mauritius, a late March storm in 2013 dumped six inches of water on the capital city of Port Louis in less than two hours. Swollen streams and rivers soon overflow. Rain was in the forecast, but not this much. And not in such a short amount of time. If the grounds are saturated as well, if you've already had a lot of moisture in the ground, there's nowhere for that water to go. You know, it only takes about six inches of swiftly moving water to knock you off your feet. That's it. Just six inches of swiftly moving water. Multiple people are washed away, caught in these instant rapids. Some are saved, but a total of 11 people die in this deluge. You know, a lot of us think of water as a friendly thing. We brush our teeth with it, we drink it, we go to the beach, it's a fun thing. But when it's moving so quickly, even a little amount can be very destructive. When we return, a cameraman almost becomes part of the story he's covering during a California wildfire. When a hot ember falls on you and you can feel the heat from it, it's enough to tell you hello. 
and a bolt out of the blue creates a shocking effect. And later, it's coming right at us. a Texas city is invaded. I mean, within two minutes, it was on top of us. I was scared. When weather caught on camera continues. A wildfire out of control. Come on, now, let's go. Two cameramen risk their lives following firefighters into the blaze. Of course, it's dangerous. Training is not like the real thing. Things change very quickly out there. Dude, your, your life ain't worth it, man. Oh, come, come on, go. Oh, oh, the exit. Oh. Cut off. In September 2002, a fire starts in the San Dimas Canyon area of Southern California. It will go into the history books as the Williams Fire. The Williams Fire is like a war zone. You have fire all around you. When you got something that's taken several days and going in the thousands of acres and you've got ground crews, hotshot teams, it's a big fire. Thirty-eight thousand acres in the San Dimas area are destroyed. Sixteen point four million dollars are spent to contain the fire. A major challenge is the rugged geography of this location in the San Gabriel Mountains. Terrain is such a huge factor when it comes to getting these fires contained and putting them out. Can you imagine being a firefighter with all that gear on and you're climbing up and down the steep terrain? On the second day of the fire, cameraman Troy Case and Rich Calgill team up for safety and head out with firefighters to capture the drama. Of course it's dangerous. Yes, it would be dangerous for me to be up there with the firefighters and next to I'm in the same danger as they are. The authorities have called for an evacuation. Rich and Troy keep filming as some people refuse to leave their homes. Some of the people weren't too happy about leaving or actually stayed and, and went back in after they were ordered out. Come on, they're here to help you, man. They want to save your life. Troy tries to reason with the homeowners. Dude, your, your life ain't worth it, man. I'm telling you, a garden hose is not going to do anything to these fires. Any water that you put on your, your house, the radiant heat is going to dry quicker than you can imagine. Come on, get out of here! And the fire department was like, come on, let's go. He goes, let me lock it up. And they grabbed him. And they said, come on, let's go. Let me get out of here. You're jeopardizing let's all go! of us. Let's go! Everyone in the fire zone is encouraged to wear protective headgear. But Troy Case takes his off. A lot of these fires are burning in the summertime, so it's already roughly 100 degrees. And the protective clothing you have on, then you have the heat with the fire. So it gets very hot out there. The problem is it's very hard to shoot with the camera with that helmet on because it wants to keep falling back off of my head. Suddenly, the exposed cameraman nearly becomes part of the story he's documenting. A canopy of trees burst into flame, showering Case and Calgill in glowing embers. You gotta remember, they're falling from the sky. I'm looking what's out in front of me through a camera. One fairly large piece was sort of landing on the back of his head. That's why I turned my light on. If an ember falls on you, not a big deal. When a hot ember falls on you and you can feel the heat from it, it's enough to tell you, hello. Without his protective headgear, Case is dangerously exposed. If it had been placed just right behind his collar, it would have had a painful burn. Troy is nearly added to the casualties of this monstrous fire. One of the things that we, we used to talk about was when we're out there videotaping and filming these incidents, you never want to become part of the problem. you got to respect that fire, and just because you've never been burned by that fire, don't think it can't happen, because it can happen in a moment's notice faster than you can imagine. From the shores of the Pacific to the bayous of Louisiana, cameras are out there, ready to capture nature's most amazing spectacles. Lightning hits an electrical pole, and giddy excitement turns first to caution, and then to fear. Aww. 2009, the student housing at McNeese State University in Louisiana. When lightning starts, one of the dorm residents decides to grab his camera in case something interesting happens. 
At first, the bolts caused some nervous giggling. But then, matters get serious. Laughter turns to silence as the danger of being so close to the voltage and concern for the cars passing so close starts to set in. I mean, when lightning strikes, you are safe when you are in a car. Let's say you're just sitting there. But if you have a live wire, you just don't want to be anywhere near that. Luckily, no one is hurt. And when the storm stops, authorities are able to stabilize the situation. Weather junkies love to get near the action, but maybe not quite this close. Oh. When we return, things get apocalyptic in the Southwest. It's coming right at us. When an eerie darkness descends. I really didn't think I was in danger until I got out of the car. And huge chunks of ice fall from the sky. Complete Armageddon. And later, a rude interruption for a Kansas wedding. I mean, it was, it was scary. When Weather Caught on Camera continues. A family experiences the dust-up of a lifetime. A mile-high wall of dirt and debris heading directly towards them. Oh, no, it's coming right in. October 2011, Lubbock, Texas. It is the autumn following an historic drought. In fact, the preceding summer is one of the hottest many can remember. And the fall hasn't offered much relief. This drought was one of the worst on record for the United States, comparable to some of the worst that this area has seen. Texas was bad. Some places, like Kansas, were even worse. But life goes on. And in West Texas, that means football. October 17th. Kevin and Courtney Watt bring their daughter and a friend to see their son take the gridiron. They arrive at 5.30 p.m. And we get there, and my husband's like, is there a fire over there? And after looking at it for a minute, I realized, that's not a fire, that's dirt. And, you know, it was coming in, and it was coming in very quickly. There's nothing good about dirt. Look at that. I had never, in all my years here in West Texas, seen anything like it. When you have really dry ground, you have all this loose soil and dirt and all everything that's on the ground. And a thunderstorm comes in. And in this thunderstorm, you have downdrafts, just these strong bursts of wind. The rain-cooled air of the thunderstorm comes rushing down to the ground. Then it hits the ground and spreads out in strong outflow. That kicks up the dust. And then on the leading edge of that, there's sometimes some rising motion that will pick the dust up into a wall of dust several thousand feet. So you get this wall of dust marching across the countryside. I've never seen anything like that. Whatever it is, it's big. It's very big. And it's coming. It's coming right at us. Sometimes these are described as sandstorms, but that's not really the case. Almost everything that you're seeing is dust. Dust raised by wind with the dust going several thousand feet up into the sky, often appearing as a wall of dust moving across the countryside. As it got closer and you saw actually how thick it was and how massive it was, this was not a regular sandstorm. It blacked out. Look at that. The dry weather has created the perfect conditions for this monumental dust storm. It didn't take long. I mean, within two minutes, it was on top of us. I was scared. Oh, no, it's coming right at us. We've seen pretty, some pretty bad storms in, in our history, but never seen a dirt storm like this. The family decides that the safest thing to do is to stay in the car. And then they see someone in the distance. I looked out the window and I just saw a random guy running. If you really look at the video, he really was running for his life. It did remind me of a movie, uh, like a horror movie when the city's running for their lives and this big monster's coming after you. He's running for his life. He did not look like he was having a very good time. No, he looked like he was ready to get out of there. Then, the stranger having run past, the dust cloud envelops them. Look at that. Kevin wants to keep his car and its passengers from being inundated by the dust from the open window. But he's determined to catch it all on camera, so he steps outside. Oh, no, I gotta keep filming. 
And my husband gets out of the car, which, you know, I'm like, are you sure you want to do that? I really didn't think I was in danger until I got out of the car and I started filming and I realized how fast that, that the gusts were. Wow. Day turns to night. The lights in the parking lot popped on because it got that dark and it was just, you know, you can see my headlights in the video. There's just a beam shooting out. And, you know, just before that, I mean, it was just regular daylight. I mean, just a regular day. It was just incredible. I was worried that something was going to fly at him without him knowing it and get hurt. When I got outside of the car and started filming, I thought I could stand out there for an extended period of time. But the, the wind speed was about 75 miles an hour and it was just pelting me. It felt like you were getting sandblasted. The Watts were in the right place at the right time to experience one of the most memorable weather events in Lubbock history. I think it was definitely an experience of a lifetime. I would have hate to have been indoors when that would have happened because it was just a, a very cool experience to watch that. Neighboring Oklahoma contends with much of the same extreme weather as West Texas. But on this day in May 2010, it wasn't a drought that concerned people. It was what was falling from the sky that was the problem. The house is shaking. It's like a freaking war zone. Oh my god, it's hitting the window! A hailstorm of epic proportions. One that will ultimately cause a billion dollars in damage. It's complete Armageddon. May 16th, Oklahoma City. It's the time of year that people are on the lookout for tornadoes. So when Aaron Snow notices that it's getting especially windy, it isn't something that he wants to play around with. It's getting windy. Hey, come here, we need to go inside. What he doesn't know is that a huge supercell thunderstorm has descended on the area. We call those thunderstorms supercell thunderstorms. They sometimes produce tornadoes as well. Those updrafts initially create small ice pellets, but then additional liquid water comes up that's chilled a little bit below freezing, freezes onto those initial kernels of ice, and the hailstone grows. When that hail gets uh, too heavy, that's when it falls to the ground. They're almost baseball. Hail ranging in size from golf balls to softballs. Hailstorms can be extremely destructive. In order to get dents on your car, for instance, you have to have golf ball size hail. That's one and three quarters inches. Those largest hailstones can sometimes get so large, up to eight inches in diameter, softball size, it can actually poke holes in roofs of things. Hailstorms, hailstones can be extremely destructive. All over town, the story is the same. This is not cool. And when the storm subsides, the power of ice hurling at extreme velocity from the sky sinks in. All the windows are ruined. Oh my gosh. This whole rooftop. Cracked the entire rooftop. Everything's ruined. Look at that house. The roof is toast. Coming up, a rude interruption for this Kansas wedding. If I would have known there was a tornado there, I probably would have took shelter and postponed the wedding. <laughs> The front row seat to a landslide from hundreds of feet in the air. And later, avalanche. I thought I was buried. And I was like, I'm I'm When weather caught on camera returns. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the gift of marriage. They say rain is good luck on your wedding day. So what kind of omen is a tornado? 
Kendra Frederick and Caleb Pence perform in the rodeo. So when he asked her for her hand in marriage, an outdoor wedding on a farm in his native Kansas seemed only fitting. The Big Day comes May 19th, 2012. Storms are in the forecast, including a chance of tornadoes. It wasn't supposed to hit until midnight. And it, it rolled in, being Kansas, you never really can tell. Um, it rolled in a lot sooner than we thought. And thus, the two become one. Let's bow together in prayer. Caleb notices that the weather is looking ominous. Well, my uncle, who was marrying us, he said, let's get it going because the rain was coming in. Me and my dad, of course, walked down the aisle and didn't notice anything going on with the weather. We just went on with it, and I did not notice anything in the background at all. But a gathering storm is right behind them, a tornado which was rated EF3. Still, the wedding proceeds as planned. If I would have known there was a tornado there before this started, I probably would not have walked down the aisle. I probably would have took shelter and postponed the wedding. <laughs> Being from Kansas, Caleb's side of the family is calm. The twister is far away and not moving in their direction. Plus, Caleb has other things on his mind. I was getting married. I wasn't really thinking about tornadoes. I really didn't care. I mean, it was very nerve-wracking for me to get married, so it, it just didn't really matter. During the ceremony, Caleb leans over and whispers to the future Mrs. Pence. I was like, hey, Kendra, there's tornadoes forming up on, by, by Harper, and she leaned over and said, I don't want to hear about it. I was like, that's not true. And I honestly just told him, I was like, no, that's not true. <laughs> we just, like, I just told him, like, just be quiet. There's no, there's not a tornado. The ceremony continues with the guest from the bride side of the family getting increasingly concerned. People came up to me afterwards, like, we need to take shelter. So, I mean, it was, it was scary thinking that was possible. The tornado, with winds estimated at 138 to 167 miles per hour, does its share of destruction, taking out a farmstead and some wind turbines near Harper, Kansas, some 10 miles to the northwest. But it stays far away, just as the Kansas relatives had predicted. We were on the backside of the storm, so I mean, really, the only way the tornado could have reversed it is the whole storm, the whole entire storm cell would have shifted, and the chances of that happening is just... Yeah, it's not going to happen. While the couple honeymoons, the video goes viral. Something that mystifies them to this day. I can see why they think, you know, we're almost crazy for just taking pictures with this thing. But but then again, it's, it's where we're from. So, I mean, that's what we deal with. I would recommend anybody to stand out there like we did. Unless you are smart enough to figure out where the storm's going, how to read the storm. Um, if you're not used to storms, don't do that. Having one's wedding become an internet sensation has its pros and cons. But the Pences choose to look at the bright side. When I watch that video, I get goosebumps. Like, honestly, because, I, I mean, that's a big tornado for what I've ever seen. Some feel that the Pences were daredevils. But was their ceremony more daring than hanging off a cliff in the French Alps? Danger doesn't bother these friends especially when it gets them this close to one of the Alps' famous mudslides. Alexandra Merviel takes out a camera. It looks like what's happening there is there is a little bit of snow, perhaps, on the top of a mountain that's melted some and is just rushing down the mountain. And when it's doing that, it's obviously picking up some dirt and some debris, and then it just halts right at the end where we have that wall. So it seems like this is a snow slide of sorts. However discategorized, the world might never have seen it if these friends didn't have the guts to hang off this rock by a rope. And if one of them didn't have the presence of mind to capture it on camera. This is different than an avalanche because you don't have snow covering the entire mountain, you know, that this big sheet coming down. It seems as if there's some melt and then it's picking up some of that dirt as it rushes down the mountain. But that can be dangerous if you're hiking up the mountain. That certainly uh, would take you out. When we return, 
an avalanche is touched off, providing a filmmaker with the ride of his life. And I was like, I'm f***ed, I'm f***ed. If you're nine feet below, you, you, it's pretty much over. Three meters down, you're pretty screwed. And an earthquake in Baja, California, produces waves of amazement and fear. All caught on camera. An adventure cameraman catches what is almost the last ride of his life, caught in an avalanche that propels him some 2,000 feet down the face of a mountain. Where's Jono? Where's Jono? Okay? And I was like, I'm f***ing, I'm f***ing. 2008. In New Zealand, August means amazing winter sports. We were really excited. We just knew we were going to have completely epic conditions. British filmmaker John O'Verity has come here to work on a snowboarding film. An experienced backcountry snowboarder, John is aware that avalanches are a constant danger. If you have different layers throughout the winter, sometimes it's freezing and then thawing and everything's piling on top of that and that slab gets unstable and that whole slab can come down. He's told the chances of an avalanche are low right now. But if one does happen here, there is a terrain trap or pit at the bottom where snow can collect. But also bury a victim deep below. You die one of two ways if you get caught in an avalanche. One is that the avalanche will drag you over a cliff or into a rock. The other is that you don't get smashed by a rock, but it stops when you're under the snow. You'll literally be set in concrete. There's no, there's no digging yourself out. So both of those are pretty undesirable ways of dying. Ten seconds. Camera in hand, Jono is shooting a tracking shot of another snowboarder who also has a camera mounted on his helmet. But they get into trouble moments into the run. As I put this turn in, it kicked up a lot of snow. I want to get snow on the legs, and snow just wasn't. I just thought, no, that's, that really has kicked up a lot of snow. And then I looked around me, and the entire face was turning into cubes and slabs of snow around me. And, and everything, although it was kind of staying in the same place, it was undulating and, and moving. And then I realized that I was in an avalanche. And my first thought was, this isn't happening to me. No, this, this is not happening to me. And then I just thought, survive this thing. I'm going to survive it. Very much on his mind is the terrain trap below, which can collect an estimated 15 feet of snow in a matter of seconds. Jono is carrying a beacon to aid in search and rescue, but if he's too deep, there won't be time to dig him out. If you're nine feet below, it's pretty much over. Three meters down, you're pretty screwed. Statistics show that if you're buried more than six feet deep, you have nearly a zero chance of surviving an avalanche. If you're closer to the surface than that in the avalanche, there's about a 90% survival rate if you're rescued within 15 minutes, about 50% if you're rescued within 30 minutes. Things are not looking good. I was hit by this wave of snow from behind and it just started getting heavier and heavier and darker and darker. Amazingly, the terrain trap actually works to Jono's advantage. It started to slow down and then it was the strangest feeling. It, it, it suddenly sped up and at that point uh, I was suddenly weightless and everything went light again. And I think what had happened is that the, the snow had gone into this terrain trap and then it had gone up and the weight of the snow had taken me right through it and spat me out and I was actually thrown into the air. Where's Jono? Where's Jono? Okay. Jono was on the surface, coughing up snow that had been forced down his throat. His partner is only on the edge of the avalanche and is able to avoid the brunt of it and come to Jono's aid. Okay. Okay. 
I needed air like I've never needed it before. Um, after that, I just was gulping breaths of air. I thought I was f***ing buried because it completely engulfed me and I was like, f***ing get out of my heart, out of my mouth. I, I knew about this pit here. And I was like, oh, f***ing you know, hell, because it completely engulfed engulf me. And I was like, I'm f***ed, I'm f***ed. Remarkably, the experienced filmmaker had held onto his camera the entire time. And it was rolling. Several seconds of my life, I was pretty convinced that I was gonna, I was gonna be facing a pretty horrible death. And to come out of that unscathed and to get it on video, it was, uh, it was brilliant. <laughs> From snow to sun, nature always seems to present a spectacle. On the border between Mexico and Southern California, people know what to expect from an earthquake. I want to get this live. 3.40 p.m. on Easter Day 2010. A 7.2 magnitude earthquake hits the Mexican state of Baja, California, about 50 miles south of the border. But it can be felt throughout the region. Many people are outside, so they safely go for the roller coaster ride. Others become fascinated by the effect it has on their pools. Take about a foot of water, more than a foot of water out of the pool. It is fascinating to see the pool sloshing around and, and realize that's from an earthquake. Some label these mini tsunamis. A wave in a pool would not be considered a tsunami as, as such. The mechanism for causing it, though, is the same. If you shift the ground beneath the body of water, you're going to get a wave. Only two deaths are reported, and considering the severity of the quake, there's only minimal property damage. The region bounces back quickly, but they'll be talking about the Easter quake on the border and the waves it fostered for a long time. seeing people who are out there they don't have any other options there's nowhere to run there's no way to escape this we just gotta survive this many people see overpasses as a place of shelter but in fact experts say that it can actually be the worst place to go going upward is a bad idea and then in the case of an overpass there's embankments with an opening there that you're going up under that will let the wind squeeze through there so it's like squeezing a tube of toothpaste that really squirts through there faster than the prevailing winds the tornado makes a beeline towards the overpass as if it's seeking out the people hiding underneath i don't know that we're going to survive this am i going to be ripped limb from limb you know are my guts going to be ripped out of my body like when you're a child you don't know what's possible Finally, the moment they are dreading arrives, and the frightened group holds on to the overpass girders and each other. I will never forget that sound. That was, that was so loud, and at the same time as the, the temperature... Get up under the girders! Chased by a tornado. She says, Dad, we're gonna die. We're gonna die, Dad. A wildfire out of control. Dude, your, your life ain't worth it, man. And an unexpected guest at a wedding. I was like, that's not true. There's not a tornado. Plus, the dust storm of a lifetime. Dread for his life. And. Oh my God. Surviving a 9.0 earthquake on top of the highest tower in Tokyo. I was a little bit worried that the, the tower was actually going to collapse. Avalanches. It completely engulfed me. And floods and hail of epic proportions. Uh-oh. It's all up next on this edition of Weather Caught on Camera.
temperature dropped and you could feel the pressure and the sound was so loud you could feel the sound i could feel the sound i think there there really is a sense of gravity you can feel the gravity of of the tornado like there's a weight to it because there's so much velocity i would say without a doubt that was the most intense 20 or 30 seconds of my life They take the brunt of it without a scratch, and the tornado keeps moving along the Kansas Turnpike. It's okay. It's over. It's over. Experts advise strongly against seeking shelter under a bridge or overpass. Most don't have the shelf this one does, so experts say they should be avoided. People should never seek shelter under an overpass. It does give the wrong impression that you can survive. It's terrible. It's a terrible thing to do. Butch and Corey reminisce from time to time about their brush with death. But younger sister Carrie doesn't. Being chased by a tornado with few options, seeks shelter in a highway overpass. Under here, under here, under here. And holds on for the ride of their lives. <laughs> April 26th, 1991, Kansas. Butch Gilbert and his daughters are driving south on the Kansas Turnpike. No stranger to tornadoes, Butch is not concerned about the weather. April's early for the tornado season in Kansas. I figured we, were, we would be okay, hadn't heard anything. Suddenly, Butch sees something in the distance. Maybe a mile away, there was a tornado, and we could tell that that tornado was coming directly toward us. Carrie, who's the younger, was in the back seat, and she says, Dad, we're going to die. We're going to die, Dad. At the time, Corey Gilbert Wallace is 14 years old. If you're in Kansas, you've seen The Wizard of Oz, you know, a million times. But I don't know that I knew what a funnel cloud was going to look like. I certainly didn't know how big it was going to be, and I didn't know how fast it could move. The tornado is one of 54 developing that day a series of twisters that ultimately kills 24 people. In his car, with the twister approaching, Butch knows he needs to locate a ditch to protect his family, but he can't find one. Typically, you want to be down low in a ditch or underground below the fast winds. At the same time, a news crew capturing the tornado on camera is also looking to save their own lives. Watch back, the Greg's catching us. You gotta go, buddy. Both have the same idea. Seek shelter under this overpass. Let's go. Get up underneath under here, here, under here, under here. The twister is barreling towards them, and tornadoes can move at speeds approaching 70 miles per hour. There was no other option for us, and there was no way that we could have kept on driving. I think if we would have kept on going, we would have been trapped in the car, in the tornado, and that we would not have survived that, I think. Get up under the girders. Is that where we want to go? Yes. And when people see us running up underneath the overpass, 